push people around the other mm -hmm. side. I love talking about with him. Yeah. He's, he's my guy. Welcome to the Secret Origins. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the Secret Origins room at Emerald City Comic Con. I'm Jonah Wyland from Comic Book Resources. Sitting to my right is one of the greatest living legends of artists, if you ask me, okay. uh, in comics right now, Mr. Mark Buckingham. Thank you very much for having me. So, unfortunately, I thought I had a big surprise for you, or not a big surprise, right. but um, uh, Bill, your, your longtime collaborator, mm -hmm. Bill, Bill Willingham, kind of ruined it. Oop, oop, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, uh, I wrote him the other day. I said, you know, there's remarkably little about your life on the internet. There's a lot about your creative work, mm. but very little about your life. And I said, I said, help me out here. I need to know some things about Mark before I, I, I sit down and interview him. So we're going to start with his questions. Okay. We're going to get to the audience uh, a little bit after that, and then I've got some of my own questions. But Fire away. I'm going to do every one of Bill's questions, and some of them are a little weird. Okay. So let's start with, uh, okay. He said, Bill Willingham says, ask him about all the secret projects he has to keep from Shelley Bond, <laughs> our Vertigo editor, from finding out you won't get an answer, but his reaction will make for good TV. <laughs> um, yeah, no, 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 I mean, well, I can tell you the one, the one she does know about is, is Miracle Man, but then I've been sort of broadcasting quite loudly for the last five years that that's sort of coming back. Sure. And as soon as Marvel um, were, were able to acquire the rights to Marvel Man, it, it, you know, it's, it's been understood that Neil Gaiman and I would sort of come back to that. So that's the thing that's sort of ahead for us. Um, to be honest, uh, Shelley, um, bless her, uh, decided that the best way to have me not working for other people was just to give me so many jobs at Vertigo that I couldn't physically fit anything else into my day, including sleep or eating. <laughs> so at the moment, I'm doing um, fables, I'm working on Dead Boy Detectives, and I'm also now writing, because I'm now writing Ferris okay. for, for Vertigo 2. So. Okay. And it, but it sounds like... Uh but you know, do you think you and Bill will continue working? I certainly hope so. Yeah, even, even um, after the end of Fables. Yeah, I, well, I mean, we we worked together prior to Fables. Sure. I mean, the very first thing we did together was um, Merv Pumpkinhead, Agent of Dream, and um, that was a wonderful book, and I, I adored drawing that. And we had plans for more, so it, it, it was a great shame that that didn't, you know, develop further at the time, but. Um, you know, it led then to Shelley and, and Bill realizing that this could be a really good team for, for the new book with Fables. So, you know, I, and, you know, I mean, I, I had other options at the time. I, I thought initially I'd only be able to do uh, one arc of Fables, and, and Shelley very kindly offered me the option of choosing whether I did the opening story with the murder mystery or whether I did Animal Farm, because Bill was ahead enough at the time that it, there were scripts available for both. And very annoyingly, I didn't want to do the first arc because I was working on Spider-Man at the time. So I was drawing Manhattan, I was drawing people. What I wanted was natural environments and animals and, and, and other, other types of subject matter to draw. And, and Animal Farm gave me all of that. And it spoiled me. The problem was that by the time I got to the end of that first arc, I, I wasn't good for superheroes anymore. It's like, okay, no, I just want to do fantasy stuff. I want to do more fables. This is the book for me. I, I'd been looking for years to find uh, a, a collaborator that, that wrote in a style that I was really comfortable with, that was writing the kind of stories I wanted to tell, and, and to find a book that I really felt at home with. And, and fables just ticked all of those boxes. So I then was ringing up saying, please, can I stay? Interesting. Um, and, and so, you know, 12 years later, um, I, I find it very hard to imagine a world without, without fables in it and without Bill and, and Shelley and everything. You know, that team, I'm gonna miss Steve so much too, because I mean, and, and Andrew and the others that I've worked with on the book and Todd's lettering, it's just that there was something magical about the combination of talents. We, we were like this, this, this perfect rock and roll band that just, you know, when we played together, it, it sounds so good, it, you know. It, and I didn't want to be the one to break the band up. I, I, you know, I was, I was sticking with them to the end, so. Uh, and I, I really want us to keep working together. I want us to find other projects to do together. Okay, uh, the next question from Bill. Ask him, all right, hold on a second. This discussion doesn't make any sense, but it is from Bill, so we'll, okay. we'll just blame him. Nothing for Bill makes sense. He says, ask him why Bill <laughs> thinks his wife Irma is fictional. Okay. Um, there, Bill has it in his mind that my, my, my lovely and beautiful wife Irma, who is Spanish 
and uh, lived for, for several years, six years, in fact, in, in, in Spain with her, and now she's living with me in the UK. Um, for many years, there was this understanding at some point she would come with me to San Diego or some American show, or there'd be some way that Bill would get to meet her, and it never happened. Every year, something's cropped up. She, she works in television and, 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 and filmmaking, and so she's often busy with, with other jobs and things. Um, and then uh, last year, Bill had decided that he was going to take a break from doing San Diego show, and I brought Irma with me for the first <laughs> time. And, and, and every, almost everybody that Bill knows has met Irma at European shows or at, at other events, and, and, and we even have you know, text messages being sent to him, photos of her with people. He just thinks that she's, she's a, a model that I hire <laughs> on a regular basis just to tease him, you know, and that, that she doesn't actually exist. So there you go. Okay. Um, uh, ask him if there's anyone in comics whose style he cannot duplicate or doesn't like enough to try. <laughs> That's a cruel question. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think there's anyone I dislike enough that I wouldn't want. I mean, there are people that's, whose styles are so difficult I wouldn't want to to kind of be too much of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've always enjoyed the fact that um, I've kind of never really had a very clear sort of Mark Buckingham style. I mean, maybe now people feel that I have because of the length of time I've spent on Fables and there's been a consistency through most of it that sort of, you know, it's evolved and changed and I've tried different things, but it, it's, it's worked in a very linear way. But I always used to be the chameleon of comics. I always used to be someone who would chop and change and new projects would come along and I'd look for, for how to, you know, to, to make them different, to, to, to challenge myself in other ways. And I've also had this habit, I mean, Neil Gaiman always used to say that I used to eat my collaborators. You know, whenever I was put with another artist, I mean, I mean Chris Pacello is the prime example. Um, I enjoyed the experience so much that I just like stole huge chunks of everything he did and worked it into my own, my own drawing style. And, and, and enjoyed the, 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 the challenge of sort of playing with that. I mean, it, came, it, it paid off because obviously with, with the second Death miniseries, uh, it gave me a chance to, to actually take over from Chris when Chris had to leave early and make it look like Chris was still there. You know, we, we, it, was, it was a seamless transition. Right. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I like to, I, I've always liked to, to work in different ways and to try different things. and I. You know, even now, I mean, with, the, with my, my current book, Dead Boy Detectives, I, I'm, I'm being very playful again. And in the, the current story arc, the Halfway House one, we have a, 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 the seven rules of being a ghost, which is done in a sort of kid's anime manga style. There's another sequence that's um, done as if it was a, a sort of halfpenny uh, Victorian uh, uh, newsprint comic from, from the, you know, 100 years ago. And, and things like you know where it's very rich and etched sort of looking style and you know I I I love the challenge of of trying different things and exploring the limits of my my capabilities. You know he, he said you're known as a comics chameleon. That actually I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of artists this weekend and there's one common theme that most artists are never satisfied with their work. Mm -hmm. But here you are able to draw so many different styles. Are Badly. You? <laughs> <laughs> so you say, are you satisfied with your work? Or was that my hint that, no, you never are? Oh, I, 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 if, if I was that comfortable and satisfied with the way I worked, I'd probably give up doing comics because there would be no challenge left. I, mm. I, I'm constantly questioning what I do. I'm always looking for, for new ways of, of expressing myself, of refining my storytelling techniques and looking for ways of improving illustration. Um, I, I don't, don't really see myself as an illustrator. I see myself as a storyteller. I've always focused primarily on, on the flow of the comic, the structure of the comic, the way I take the reader on that journey. I don't consider myself to be a good illustrator. I always question the quality of, of the end result. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm usually satisfied enough with, with, that, with that, with the unfolding of the story that it sort of allows me to sort of feel okay about it and keep moving on, but the art side of it is always something I sort of question and fight with. Okay. The next question Bill had... Mm -hmm. um, wait a second, I just lost it here. That's probably for the best. 
<laughs> Ask him what secret place he's going off to in the three days immediately following ECCC. Well, you know what? I'm not actually sure. Bill's taking me away somewhere. He, they, he tells me that there's some, some place on the coast here where we can go on a boat and go watch whales and dolphins, um, which all sounds very lovely, except I actually think what's going to happen is I'm going to find myself wrapped in chains and dumped <laughs> into the ocean, and there'll be some wonderful new artist who will be forced to adopt the Ing Ham bit to their name, who will join the Fables team for the final year. I, I think that's kind of how it's going to work. Um, but no, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, Bill and I, um, you know, we've known each other for a few years now, but we've only ever sort of met at shows. I mean, it's not like we've ever really had a chance to properly spend any time together. Um, so I'm looking forward to actually having a little vacation with Bill. And I think it's also going to be very good for us because, as I say, we're Fishing now into this out. final year of Fables. And we're at that point where the two of us are going to have to sit down and bash our heads together to see if we can actually remember who all the characters in the book are because our cast is so vast at this point that we really don't want to miss anybody out as we're going through wrapping up this this last year and we want to you know it the the title of the of this this last story arc is, is happy ever after uh, whether that's genuinely what we're going to give you or whether it's an ironic statement because maybe it won't be a happy ending but you know we we want to try and give the readers a chance to say goodbye to all their favorite characters mm. And in the pages of Fables, we're going to have a little backup story in every issue, which will focus on a particular character, so we get to say goodbye to them. And there'll be a large number of those when we get to our giant 150-page final issue. And then in Fairest, um, with, with my story arc, I'm going to be focusing on the farm and the animal characters. And so that's my chance to say goodbye to those characters that actually were the ones that made me so fall in love with the series when I joined it. Sure. So this is going to be a, a very nice sort of completion of the circle for us. And so, you know, actually spending a bit of time together to go over all of this stuff before we throw ourselves into, into writing these and drawing these final issues is going to be really important. Okay. Uh, the last question from Bill was, and finally, ask him what's that embarrassing thing Bill knows about you that even he is too good a friend to tell CB. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, I, I always find that Bill struggles to find things to tease me about because I don't tend to give him that much ammunition. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> which is probably best because he teases me all yeah, the time. Yeah, he, uh, he he he'll tease me a, a lot when he gets the chance. But um, uh, I'm trying to think now. Oh, there's probably plenty of things. We'll get back. Yeah, we'll get back. We'll get back. Okay. Um, let's go to the audience and see if they have any questions, and then we'll come okay. back and keep talking. Perfect. If you, go ahead. Out of all the characters in the Fable universe, past and present, who's been your favorite? Um, okay, well, um, Flycatcher is pretty much my favorite of the male cast. I mean, I, I, I'm very fond of Boy Blue too, and, and, and his story was something I really enjoyed telling. But, um, but you know, Flycatcher is the, the, the character I saved Bill from killing in the March of the Wooden Soldiers. You really? know, it was the first time I stood up to Bill on the book and said, no, no, this is not how it's going to be. <laughs> I like this one. And he's like, and, he, and Bill's like, but he, he's the joke character. He's just the fly-eating janitor. We can afford to get rid of him. He's like, no, there's something really, he's the one true innocent in, in the Fables world. You know, he's, he's the one character who's, you know, who's really need, we need to look at and explore. And that's what inspired the whole you know, Frog Tail in, in A Thousand One Nights of Snowfall and then The Good Prince arc. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've always had a huge affection for that character. On the female side, it's Rose Red, who uh, very early on I changed her likeness to be like my, my wife Irma. So, um, you know, she, she, she's very precious to me because of that, that connection. And otherwise, it's it's all the animal characters, all the farm residents. You know, it's interesting. I've talked to uh, a number of artists about this. I always ask them what they hate to draw. Right. And primarily, not all of them, mm -hmm. but primarily they say they hate drawing animals. Uh, Keith Giffen, in, in my interview with him, I keep on bringing this up because mm -hmm. it was so funny. I said, what do you hate to draw? And he just blurts out, horses. I hate horses. <laughs> I can't do their musculature. Yet, you embrace animals. I hate like drawing people. That's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That no, really no, no. I mean, I, I not, I'm not really that bothered about technology. I'm not really bothered about drawing cities. I like, um, I, I, I like organic things, and I love drawing birds and wildlife and insects and 
trees and you know that's the stuff that, that excites me I mean maybe it's partly because I lived in a little town and I was used to you know I, I lived in a valley between two woods and, and that was what I was surrounded by and my father always inspired my love of the natural world so I you know I, for me that's that's my comfort zone mm -hmm. and drawing people is is frustrating I I, I, I find pretty people particularly annoying um, I, I, I love, I love, I love a bit more character. That's why you know the characters that you see in fables that are really my my favourites are, are people like Pinocchio and and Flycatcher and those ones where I really give them a very distinctive look that's quite you know it has more of a cartoon sort of heart to it. And the characters I always try to get rid of really early on are the, the people like Jack and Prince Charming and stuff like that. So when, you know, whenever I chat with Bill about, about where the book's going, I start hinting at which ones really ought to have a horrible <laughs> end very soon. You know, so kill the humans. Yeah, <laughs> kill the humans. Kill the pretty ones. Yes, let's get rid of those. Um, and, um, and also, you know, sometimes things will crop up where it's... I mean, a, a prime example is the Woodland Building, uh, we, you know, the original Bullfinch Street Fable Town. Um, because I didn't design it, and also because you know Bill had some some plans that he did, but also you know, landed some various drawings. But there was never really a, like a, a single focused image that showed you everything as it should be. I always struggled to draw it. Mm. I always found it a, a sort of a, a strange combination of elements that were difficult to work with. So I just said to Bill one day, "Can we just you know crumble the whole thing down and build a new one?" Sure. And Bill said, "Okay." And you know, and I said, "And can I build a castle out of the, the ruins?" And he said, "Okay." Uh, and then I foolishly designed a castle that was equally impossible to draw. <laughs> so I, I, you know, so now I'm saying to Bill, "Can we destroy the castle now?" And I was like, "Well, you know, that's that's kind of me." I. I, I I, I, so I find some things difficult to draw, and then I go and set myself an even more impossible challenge to follow it. So I, you know, I think, but again, that's part of me always setting new parameters and trying different things. You've been a part of some absolutely amazing series, important series in comics, mm -hmm. uh, Sandman, Miracle Man, uh, and now Fables, which is mm -hmm. a very long run. And it's uh, this also ties back into your your comics community thing. I have a, a my good friend Tracy. Mm -hmm. She uh, she's not a comics fan. Right. Uh, never has been. Not until. Uh, you know, she got to know me. It's like, let me, let me read some of these things. And I got her, I got her to read Sandman. She likes Sandman. And I got her some other books. And then she, she found Fables on her own. Mm -hmm. She just walked into a comic shop and told them what I like. And they recommended Fables. And that's her favorite series right. of all time. Oh, thank you. And I told her, I said, uh, you're aware that Mark worked on Sandman? She said, no, 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 no. And she went <laughs> back and she looked and she goes, his art's different. Yeah. Yeah, because he is a comics chameleon. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, do you feel... You've worked on these special series, and I, yeah. I'm not sure how to put this without sounding silly, so I'm just going to do it. Okay. Do you feel like a special artist because you have been a part of comics history at this point? Do you, are you aware of the impact you've had on this industry? No, I still think I'm a fraud. I still think that I, I'm, I'm this close to someone finding out that I really shouldn't be in this business and beating <laughs> me out. Um, <coughs> And I know, and I and funny enough, it's quite frustrating to some of my friends. I mean, I know Neil came and you know, is is constantly bemused by the fact that I I don't believe in 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 myself or what I've I've achieved over the years. I think certainly the 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 level of success that that's that I've had with Fables and the fact that I've I've you know I, I'm aware that a lot of the recognition has has come for the art as well as for Bill's writing has allowed me to feel a little more confident about what I'm doing and to feel more positive and and especially all the the kind of the love and support that comes from the Fables fans has really made a difference to me in terms of of, of making me feel more positive about what I do but I I think you know in many ways the the chameleon thing was also a sort of if, if I'm a moving target and I keep chopping and changing and they can't quite spot me, right, right. <laughs> they won't be able to track me down for long enough to say no. He has to go now. So, but it's it's also um, I think I just I, I just enjoy uh, the variety and the challenges. And, but but in terms of my sort of position in the, in the business, I, I am I am aware now that I have been extraordinarily fortunate and that I have. A career that's that's sort of based on, on having been a part of some some of the greatest comics there have ever been, and I, I feel, you know, that that's that's a great privilege. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Go ahead.
sobering up once upon a time, and sobering up grim. And I was wondering uh, if you could get into your feelings about if you felt like you got ripped off, or how that all affected you, or mm -hmm. if that affected you at all. So the question is about uh, Fables trying to get off the ground as a TV show. It never quite happened, mm -hmm. uh, yet we are we do have two Fables type shows on TV in Once Upon a Time and Grimm, and what your feelings are on that, and do you feel like you got ripped off a little bit? Well, I mean, I, <coughs> it's not really for me to say whether I feel ripped off. I mean, it, it, you know, it, Fables is Bill's creation, and, you know, I think it, it, you know, if anybody was to, to feel you know, sad or, or, you know, upset about that situation, I could understand if, if he did, but at the same time, that you know, it's very nice that you know TV shows and movies and things get made based on on the stuff we create. But I mean, that's never really been my focus. I mean, I I I make comic books because I love comic books, and I think it is a unique and precious way of communicating a story that I want to be a part of and to and to maintain and to develop and to you know to push boundaries and bring new people into it because I I genuinely believe that. That comics is is an art form that should be cherished and and loved for for many more generations to come because I think there is nothing else quite like it in terms of a, a complete experience of, of of taking in a story that is uh, expansive and and um, something that you can, you can really lose yourself in but it's also a very personal thing because it's it's a creator or a very small creative team communicating on a one-to-one -one basis with the reader and the way the reader experiences that story is very personal to them in terms of whether they race through it or whether they dwell on every page you know it, it, it's it's unlike any other way of, of, of entertaining yourself and um, you know so that's always been my focus that's always where I've, I've kind of laid my attention you know I, I've, I've watched once upon a time I've watched Grimm I, I, I've enjoyed both I mean I have no great sort of problems with, with any of that. I mean, it would have been lovely if there had been a Fables TV show. I'm sure it, it, it could have been great, but it could also have been horrible. I mean, you know, there, there's never any guarantee that what will be developed from it will have any bearing on, on, on where it came from. And if, even if it does, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to communicate well in another format. I mean, it's been very nice to see how successful Fables has been as a, a video game, for example. I mean, that was a great transition. That worked very well for it. Um, so I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is that I don't really worry about that at all. I mean, it's a shame that you know, the opportunity was there and you know, it, it didn't work out. But at the same time, I kind of expected that this would happen because the reality is that what Bill did was he realized there were all these amazing characters that were out there in the public domain. And he realized that if you kind of mixed them up and created something new and fresh out of the combining those elements together in a new way, in a new world, you could create a fantastic uh, story. And, you know, to, to be fair, you know, they didn't have to buy fables. That core concept idea could be taken on by anyone because all those characters are in the public domain. They just give it their own spin. So in many ways, Grimm and Once Upon a Time could very well have been the Fables TV show um, because that's how they might have interpreted the material. Right. You know, so I, I, I don't personally worry about these things too much. And, and I know Bill stopped worrying about it because he sent me a total surprise on a Saturday right. night once. He sent me this long essay that was an interview with himself mm -hmm. Uh, talking about, that, like, don't <laughs> blame the Once Upon a Time creators. They didn't steal from us. Yeah. Here are the reasons why. And mm -hmm. he talked about talking to, the, to those creators. And, and that conversation stopped finally. Yeah. And I, I thought that was, that was very pragmatic and, yeah. and smart of Bill. Yeah. Uh, if he, if, if, and, and he truly believes that. Mm. There, there are interesting moments in the history of fables, though. Uh, and we'll go right back to the beginning. Because um, it started at a time where Bill couldn't get arrested in college. There was right. a period there where, where, where he was kind of pushed out. Mm. Bill's not a guy who shies away from sharing his opinion. Right. Uh, he tends to be one of the, uh, the, 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 the most well-spoken conservatives in an industry dominated by liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it got him in some trouble. Yet he got Fables off the ground, and then it started winning Eisner Awards. And that's when it's one of those few times where I've seen the Eisner Awards really have an effect mm. on a book. 
Uh, and I remember Bill telling me at the time, was like, this book got no support, didn't yeah. get any support from DC in terms of like really publicity. It just kind of was put out there. Mm -hmm. um, talk about those, why do you think Fables has, 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 has connected in the way it has? Is it just this familiarity with the, the grim fairy tale? That, is that what that, it really I think, is? I think that's a, a big part of it. I think it's, it's very easy for people you know, trying to, to look to, to, to start reading a comic these days, especially if they haven't got much experience uh, of the business, to be put off by all the kind of the rich continuity history, all the uh, the, the crossovers and the, and the sort of multiple plot lines and stuff. Here was something that was new and fresh, where you could get in on the ground floor and get to know all these characters from day one. And they are all based on on folk tales and 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 you know characters that we've seen in in movies and read in storybooks when we w when we were children. So we all have this kind of base level understanding of who they are. And then what Bill did was add that magic twist in terms of the way he paired them up and and arranged these characters and and picking up on things like you know with Prince Charming having actually been married to all of these princesses right. and, and right. what trouble that would cause. I mean just si simple but brilliant ideas like that that just made this something special. And I also, I really think a lot of the success of Fables is just the quality of the writing in terms of the characterization, the interplay between the cast. I mean, Fables is very much, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a daily soap opera almost. Anyway, it, yes. has, it has that quality where you get invested in these characters' lives. And it isn't, it isn't like a lot of books... Um, you know, your iconic, say, superhero books or whatever, where, where um, every so often there is this necessity to hit a restart button because you kind of have to go back and remind everybody of who these characters are and where they came from. And if you've gone a little bit too far in one direction, you can take yourself away from that. So you need to sort of go back and, and re-establish re, re, re that world on a, on a base level again. With Fables, we're, we're telling this tale that's a generational tale. I mean, we, we you know... These characters have, have changed, evolved. They, they, you know, there are marriages, there are children, there are children of children. I mean, we, we are taking our readers on a very long story. Uh, and, and I think, you know, because we, we stay true to it, we don't, we don't cheat the reader. I mean, we, we, we keep, you know, if somebody dies, you know, you know, we, we might sometimes imply that someone's died and then they pop up somewhere. But, you know, <laughs> if you genuinely see someone like, you know, the, like that boy Blue passing away, you know, I mean, that was, that was a difficult story to tell because we knew we were, we were genuinely letting him go. And, you know, we, 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 we seeded sort of the, the idea that he may uh, sort of return because in many ways it was certain members of the cast, like Stinky the Badger, willing for him to come back because of how much they, they cared about him. And in, in that way, we were trying to echo some of the feelings and sentiments of, of the readership, right. you know. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, we, 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 you know we, we, we deal with these things as we go along, but I think we stay true to that and we take, we're taking the readers on a, a, a continuous path. We're not, we're not going to at any point kind of trick them, as it were. I find that answer incredibly interesting because not at any point in that answer did you reference your own artwork. And your own contribution to it, and 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 because I I know people who have looked at fables and said, you know, Mark's artwork is what actually brought me in. I didn't have any interest in the grim fairy tales myself, but Mark's artwork was so beautiful, I had to come in. Who who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> I never meet them. Please tell me, tell me. No, no, no. That's very nice. Um, I I I I didn't know that, and I I, I, I mean, I, I people are very complimentary about, it, but again, I you know I, I I know I contribute, and I know I'm part of the the team that makes. Fables, what it is, but I, I don't, I don't dwell on that. You're a very aspect. humble man, aren't you? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's. I want to move to another subject here. Uh, the finally, Miracle Man is coming coming back, yes. and, and I think it's a it's a rather wonderful moment in the history of comics as well. It's great that you're involved. Um, let's start with that process. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, you were one of the earliest creators contacted and, and you said, yes, I'm, yeah, please bring it back into print. I'm, I'm right. totally gung-ho. But it was a long process. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that process and how involved you were in, in any of that. I wasn't really involved at all. They I think called you up it, and said, it, it, I, I think the, 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 the reality of the situation is that, I mean, for a long time, it's been understood that... Um, 
you know, Neil and I felt bad that you know, Eclipse folded, that we weren't able to complete that story. We, Alan had, Alan Moore had uh, entrusted his baby to us and, and, and we kind of dropped the ball on our watch. And it, 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 was, a, it was a difficult thing to deal with, the fact that we, we'd lost this, this project midway. And, and you know, Neil, Neil, Neil fought hard along the way to, to try and, you know, save, save the book, get, get that project back. Um, you know, we, we, I, I, have not really involved myself in any of the sort of the legal aspects of all, all of what's been, been going on. But I mean, it, I, right from day one, it, you know, I sort of effectively handed Miracle Man over, over to Neil and, 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 and said, okay, you know, you're, you're fighting on behalf of us both. So. Obviously, once once things were settled and Marvel had come into the picture and they did the deal with Michelangelo's people, so that now Marvel Man could return to you know be part of the Marvel universe um, or however they want to kind of use that character in the future, it opened the door for us to be able to then look at how we we bring Miracle Man back. But I mean, it was, I, I think it was pretty much always taken as as read that you know if 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 Neil's writing it, I'm drawing it, and so. You know, I th you know, whenever I see the guys at Marvel, it's just a question of, yeah, it's coming soon. You yeah, know, and yeah. that's it. And yeah. that's the sum total of the, the, the conversation. So, I mean, it's only really now, these last few months, you know, where I did the variant cover on issue one, and I'm now talking with them about, you know, uh, gathering up all the artwork so that we can actually rescan everything and talking to Disraeli about recoloring stuff and, and starting to plan for what we do with the with the new material. How do you, you know, uh, uh, already there have been some needed changes to the artwork mm. uh, in order to get it out there digitally on Comixology because Apple has certain standards right. uh, that they will allow to be published and some not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about your artwork being touched to get this out to a modern audience? Um, I, I should think we'll, we won't have too many troubles with my, with my things. You don't think um, so? I, I'm not e anticipating much. Um, uh, it's not, I'm not, that, not that I'm a prude, but I have a tendency to uh, to think that less is more. So I don't tend to show things that might cause problems in terms of sort of nudity or, or a, you know anything too graphic in terms mm -hmm. of, of violence and stuff like that. Um, as far as the actual artwork goes, I I had such an affection for Miracle Man that I I couldn't sell the art. So mm -hmm. with the exception of, I think, about 10 pages in total where there were some that I gave to people or just to let a few little odd pieces out, I still have absolutely everything. So that's going to help, except it's sure. falling apart because you know, it's <laughs> 20 years old and the glue's gone and you know, things, are, things are breaking down. But I, you know, at least it allows me to be able to gather all of that stuff up and to be able to you know, make sure that we can get the best possible reproduction. It's going to be... Um, are particularly important with regard to the Golden Age because in that, um, you know, that you have to remember when, when Neil and I started this, we were following on directly from, from an arc that had been written by Alan Morton, drawn by John Tottleburn. And yeah. to my mind, it was one of the most beautiful and incredible comics I'd ever seen. And we had to follow that. And we were both newbies. I mean, Neil had the violent cases. He was starting to get... Sandman. He wasn't Neil Gaiman yet. He no. wasn't Neil Gaiman. You know, I mean, w I mean w when Neil approached me, it, uh, it was a Christmas party, and, and he came up to me, and, and I showed him this four-page strip I'd done for a little British anthology, and it, it involved this female character had the kind of the twinkle effect, and it was very, you know, she had a, a, a lightness to her that he just saw, and he said, this is, this is, this is Marvel Man, this is Miracle Man, this is, you know, and he, and he said, Alan's asked me, if I'll take over writing this book, and you know, I, I you know, I work with Dave because we were friends with Dave McKean as well, and um, he said, but you know, I, I can write fast and Dave can draw, so I, I'm looking for an artist to work. Do you want to do it? And I, I, I was still halfway through my degree at, at, at you know college. I still do my art degree. I'd had nothing, you know, virtually nothing in print. I was I was complete nothing. And, I, and I, it was it was so daunting mm -hmm. to suddenly be asked to even consider doing something like that. And I think one of the ways that Neil helped me, kind of, well, helped us both to kind of get around that, was we didn't try to follow by immediately being like the next panel mm -hmm. of the story that Alan and John were telling. We immediately changed the focus. 
So we looked at the effect that all of these things that have been happening in the book had had on all the other people in, in this world. And, and uh, with each of those stories, because it was a different person's worldview, I could use a different art style to represent it. Um, which meant that I really went a little bit crazy with, with the possibilities. So I had everything from almost like German expressionistic in terms of some of the structuring to the things that were very bold and very austere with just a couple of pounds per page to something that was a children's book to something that was a photocopy montage to something that was white crayon on black paper. And I mean, the pro and, you know, there were watercolor paintings and there was pastel drawings and I was just so playful. And... You know, that, and the problem is the reproduction quality back then was not what it is now. So it's going to be interesting to actually go back to all of these pages of artwork and to, and to you know, reassess it and, and, and try and get better reproduction of it all and see if actually now what you'll be able to read when those issues come out is a much truer representation of what I was setting out mm -hmm. to achieve with those first stories. I like what you said where you talked about the playfulness of that art. Are you that playful today? Um, I, I, yes, I think I still am. I think I lost it for a while. There was, there was a, a big period in the 90s where I my, I mean, I probably sound like I have no confidence whatsoever, but that I, it That's was... every artist, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, but it, it's, you're it was company. particularly low in the wake of Miracle Man ending the first time around um, because I really felt like I was onto something. And to have that taken away from me left me floundering around not knowing where I was going. And that's mm. part of the reason why I spent a big chunk of the 90s as an Inca. Mm. Because for me, I, I had faith in myself as a craftsman, but I wasn't sure if I could, if I, if I knew what my voice was in mm -hmm. terms of being a, a, an artist in my own right. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time to sort of get that back. Now I think I'm at that point where the playfulness is, is coming to the fore again. And in every project that I'm doing, you know, even with something like Dead Voice, you know, I'm using multiple styles within the book. I'm using another approach again with the watercolor gray tone wash paintings that I'm creating for the covers. You know, I'm, I'm looking for ways to, to push boundaries and, and, to, and to challenge myself again. But using the experience of the 25 years in the business to refine that to a point where now I, that you know, it feels mature, it feels settled. Mm. Okay. Um, if, if anybody has any more questions, we have time for one. Go ahead. The question's about Sandman and whether you were aware of how important that series was at the mm -hmm. time. Because today's day and age, you have a lot more communication with the fans. Mm -hmm. Back then, you may not have. Were you aware of that appreciation? Um, not so much, um, I must admit. I mean, we, we were aware, um, you know, certainly by the midpoint in the run, we, we knew we were, we were doing something good. And we knew that uh, a lot of fans were really taking to, to, the, to the book and being really supportive. And Neil's, Neil's fans were particularly loyal and dedicated right from day one, and that was a lot to do with the way that he r respected and treated them and, and was very accessible to his fan base. So, I mean, I think that was, that was something we were aware of. But I think uh, for a while it was very much, it was like Sandman and Neil that we kind of, we, we, it, and, and I think for a lot of us on the art side, we were just like contributing to, 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 to that creation. But I don't know if we were necessarily aware of, of the extent to how big it was getting. Um, but you know, certainly by the end, we, we knew that this was, this was something wonderful and, and its loss was going to be really you know, felt by the readership. But at the same time, you know, it was, it was a perfect enclosed story. I mean, I think, I think it would have been a shame at that point to have just c perpetuated it for no other reason than, than people liked reading it. Sure. Uh, any other questions? I want to finish then with inking. Yeah. Uh, like you talked about, you, you got away from that playfulness in your art, and that's why you became primarily an inker for a, a period of your career. Steve, and I think I can say his name, last name right, Lealoha? Yep. Oh, I'm pretty good. Uh, <laughs> he inks you on fables. Yes. As an inker yourself, i got to imagine you can be pretty picky about who inks your penciled artwork. Um, I can be. I think I'm probably far more relaxed than I used to be. And mm. I think 
working with Steve has been a big part of why I'm more relaxed now. Um, I, I, f I found it amazing that I was even given the opportunity to work with Steve in the first place because he's such a phenomenal talent in his own right. And I think what made Fable so good for me in those early days was the fact that I knew I could, I could trust him, not necessarily to f you know, follow line by line, but to take what I, I did and to make it look wonderful, irrespective of you, you know, what, what I'd given him. He seemed to be able to sort of bring his, his, his magic to, to bear on the piece. I mean, I, I do tend to drive uh, my ink is a little bit mad because of my tendency to want to experiment and try different things. Mm -hmm. I, I think there was a period during um, Storybook Love and, and um, uh, Mean Seasons where I was doing a lot of stuff with, with tones. But the thing was, it wasn't like a, a zip tone where you just uh, stick it down or, or a dot screen which you'd rub onto the board. I was actually taking newspaper photographs, blowing them up until they broke down into dot patterns, mm -hmm. and then using chunks of that mm -hmm. that actually stuck into the art, built into, you know, photo fo 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 stats of that blown up huge to, to try and build into the artwork. And so the, you know, they'd get these strange constructions with layers of bits in corners, and I'd ink round them and, and put little effects in and stuff, and then they'd somehow have to try and ink the rest of the page. And I, 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 I do tend to sort of sometimes drive people spare with, with that kind of thing. But um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think that, uh, the funny thing is, I th as, as things have progressed, and I've become more confident in myself in terms of, of just the storytelling and, and the structuring of the, of the tale, I've I've found myself worrying far less about the that 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 next stage in the process because uh, I'm I'm quite content once the pencil page leaves me to feel that my part of the process is done. I mean I'm very fortunate with with Fables. I mean Shelley Bond is an incredibly supportive um, editor on on the book and she's allowed me access to sort of every stage in the process. So I, I supervise inks. So I can I supervise the color as much from a continuity point of view as anything else. I, I'm, I'm the Fables continuity cop. Uh, uh, you know, Bill, Bill remembers most things, but I'm the one who's sacrificed keeping real life in his brain to actually just store Fables universe for the last 12 years. <laughs> and rather looking forward to a year from now doing an info bump dump so that I can actually remember the names of you know, my niece and nephew and things <laughs> like that, because at the moment I know nothing. Um, so you know, so but, but yeah, from 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 the art point of view, I know I I I actually really enjoy seeing how different inkers work with me and, and seeing what they bring to the plate. So but there was a time when I think the problem was when I was an inker, and I then started to make that transition into penciling, because I was so focused on the final look of things, it made it very difficult for me because mm. um, everything that I sent off because it wouldn't come back looking the way I would have inked it. Mm. It was it was hard to, to, to deal with, it was hard to see. Now I, I, I have the the distance from that period to be able to um, you know just be comfortable with what other people bring to the bring to the work. Very cool. Mark, absolute pleasure and thank you very much for thank you so here. much. It's Mark Buckingham. <laughs> thank you. That's really good. You did good. Thank, thank you. you. It was a lot of fun. Well, it's my pleasure. Now I want to know about the adventure you're going to go on with Bill. I can't <coughs> wait to hear about it. Well, so, so I think it's called Orca Island or something. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're basically going away for... Is he here? Bill's here.